Wednesday. So not only would I get our mail, but find somebody who served and thank them or do something special or go to a fundraiser or something like that. I try to do something on Veterans Day. Um, There's always free meals all over. Free meals for veterans all over. That is the truth of it for sure. Um, in, other, in other years, I'd like to go out to the graveyard and see my grandpa's grave site. He was a veteran of World War II, so yeah. I know, yeah. I know a guy that's going for breakfast at McDonald's in the morning and he's going to go to uh, Honkers for lunch. And, nice. And then Martin's for a good dinner. Right on. I see that it was at Martin's too, but that's awesome. Gary's talking about a veteran who is got three places he's going to go for breakfast, lunch, and dinner Monday because they have free meals for veterans. So that's pretty nice. I like that the community does that kind of stuff. Is there any other announcements or birthdays or anything we need to? Um, how, about, how about Thanksgiving? The Thanksgiving service is the 24th of November, I believe is the date. It's the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and I still don't know where it's at. I'm assuming I'm going to find out this Wednesday because it's um, the ministerial lunch is this Wednesday, and usually all the decisions are made there, and so I'm... No, I, I met at your house. Oh, Thanksgiving, my house, yeah. I, I, Brian last week said that we should have it here. Uh, I heard other people say that it's nice to have it at my house because it's more homey, so I don't know.
And, and I felt like this really isn't helping us as pastors to know that. This is helping maybe the Oakland people out here, but not us as, you know, Christians, I should say. As priests out here in the world dealing with the real stuff. And the thing, and it occurred to me, too, as I was sitting there, that um, the last time I was up here and preached, I, I preached about depression and, and uh, how to find joy. And I thought, wow, this learning this stuff here about trauma is going to go perfect with that last message I gave about joy and, and having that wash away your sadness and your depression and stuff. Trauma uh, was something that happens in a bunch of different stages in our life, in a bunch of different ways. And one of the ways is that it's your living situation that you might be in. You know, uh, you think about people that are constantly starving, like in Africa and stuff like that. They go through continual trauma because they were continually starving. Their living conditions are continually creating trauma for them. And then we think about natural trauma, where like you're exposed to a hurricane or a tornado or a wildfire or something like that that creates trauma in your life, but that's a natural occurrence. And then you have... Um, uh, trauma that another person has caused on you, whether it be uh, abuse or sexual abuse or, you know, um, anything that somebody else does to you. And then there's perpetrator trauma, which the person who perpetrated the whatever it was has trauma about it. And then that comes into play when you have uh, young men, you know, in war having to shoot people, having to kill people. And that, you know, a lot of times that creates trauma for that person. And the biggest thing is that, oh, here we go. Maybe. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, everybody has heard of uh, PTSD, uh, post traumatic stress disorder. What the lady said, though, and she, like I said, she, it was mostly clinical, but she tried to bring it over to Christianity because they are Mennonite and there was a bunch of us pastors there trying to take this information in. She called it post-traumatic soul disorder. And as she went through this, I realized how inefficient her teaching was. Because if it truly is a soul disorder, then we have to fix it from the spiritual end. We have to fix it from the spiritual end. The flesh might be tame for a short amount of time, but only the spirit is going to bring your soul back to where it needs to be. And so as she went through all this stuff, I, I was just getting exasperated, and I showed Anthony my notes. And one thing that I discovered through the whole thing is that nobody is, I shouldn't say nobody, almost nobody uh, will be free from trauma in their lives. Trauma is going to happen to almost everybody at some point in time in their lives. Whether, like I said, I just went through all the different aspects, whether it's your living conditions or a natural trauma or somebody perpetrated against you or maybe you have to be a perpetrator or were a perpetrator. Trauma is going to happen in your life. And what happens through trauma, what we learned is that your body goes through a natural um, process. The uh, amygdala, what is it called? There's a little, there's a little speck in your brain that's about the size of an almond. And when trauma happens to our bodies, what happens is that little thing shoots off a bunch of hormones in our bodies, and our eyes open up, and our hearing is is accelerated, and our heart rate starts going up and beating faster, and all these things happen. And when our flesh starts reacting, our soul is going to be affected by it. So let's see if I can switch this now. Um, basically, trauma is when something terrible has happened. And a lot of people, this is what happens with trauma. If you're in your flesh, if you're stuck in that situation of trauma, something terrible has happened is what keeps rolling through your mind. You are continually reliving that situation in your, in your brain and in your mind. And when trauma, the biggest thing about trauma is that trauma affects the flesh. Okay? Whatever trauma has happened.
happened to you, it likes the flesh, okay? And your mind is part of your flesh, okay? And so your, when your flesh is affected by all of a sudden your brain starts rolling that trauma, you, you relive it, okay? And every time that that happens, every time you say something terrible has happened, your amygdala in your brain shoots those chemicals back out through your body again, and you physically relive that. So your flesh just keeps going through this over and over. And one of the things that I, I think that you guys might be able to touch on is how many people have had somebody die unexpectedly in their life? That is a good trauma that a lot of people have gone through. Tra when something terrible has happened, someone dies unexpectedly, that creates trauma in your life. You know somebody that died unexpectedly? It's a bummer, isn't it? Two people? That creates trauma in your life. Now, most people, a lot of people, the statistics show, the United States show, that a lot of people are abused as children. So, you've already had trauma before you even knew what the word trauma meant. A lot of people have had that happen. And then you go on through life, and other things affect you. Like I said, an unexpected death in your family, um, abuse at school, or, you know, like you said, you know, you live through a tornado, which some people in Napanee have done. All these things create trauma in our life. And if we don't fix that, if we don't take the time to heal that, it grows. There was a quote that was given during the um, seminar, and it says, Trauma that is not transformed will be transferred. And what happens is that we live with this trauma. Something terrible is happening. Okay? And, and everybody knows you have three responses to stuff like that. Fight, flight, or freeze. Okay? So you have these people that are reliving this trauma because if it's not transformed, it's transferred. So now we're living with this trauma, okay? We're reliving it. We're shooting off these chemicals through our brain every time we come, every time we relive it, every time something reminds us of it, because we're still living in that situation. So now we're fearful, okay? If we're the kind of people that would run away, um, we run away from what's important. So we run away from what's important. Then we get to, if you're freeze, basically you don't do anything in life. You're the kind of people who close yourself up in your house, you don't ever get out, you don't ever extend the word to anybody, you just, you freeze up. I don't want anything to happen to me like that again, so I'm just going to crawl into a hole, is how I say it. The flight is running away from it, running away from their problems, running away from anything that could relive that trauma. Freezing is just crawling into a hole and forgetting about it. And then fighting, of course, we all know what that means. We're going to fight back. The problem is, is that when you do any three of those things, you're transferring that trauma onto somebody else. You are now taking what trauma happened to you, and other people are now being affected by it because of your reaction to it. And now, of course, when trauma first happens, we all expect these things. But what happens if we're not healed from that, we keep reliving it. It's sad, <laughs> and it's fixable, and it's, and it's, um, at the clinic, if they have somebody that has trauma, that is reliving it, that is doing just what I said, they're, you know, the chemicals shoot through their body once a day, once a week, you know, some people are really suffering, they live through that trauma like every hour, and so they're continually doing this to their body. So in the physical realm, the Oakland people, the, the, the clinic side of this, says that, that that little almond-sized piece in your brain that puts out those chemicals anytime you relive the trauma, or when you first live it, and then every time after that, if it is ignited so many times, it actually starts doing damage to your body. The chemicals that it releases actually start tearing down your body. So you are physically hurting yourself every time you relive that drama. And the other thing that happens is that little almond-shaped thing is only supposed to go off maybe a hundred times in your life. Because, you know, trauma is trauma. You're, most people don't live through trauma. <laughs> a lot of times the trauma, you know, if it's a bad enough trauma, you might not even live through it. But it's only expected to go off about a hundred times in your life. It's not meant to be a continually pulsating, it's not your pituitary gland, let's put it that way. So what happens is that that eventually starts shrinking and shriveling and not being able to, um, to work the same way in your body. And then it either will 
sprout out a bunch of hormones for you when you least expect it, or it'll stop doing that, and you will basically you start fading into a different kind of person. And that's the clinical look of what happens if you are stuck in a trauma cycle. You guys have heard me say this a lot of times, and they did not mention it, and because we have this knowledge, I just, I just felt like I should tell this lady at Oakland, hey, you're missing a big piece of it. Your soul is in the middle of your flesh and your spirit. And like I said, that lady called it post-traumatic soul disorder. She didn't call it stress disorder. She acknowledges the fact that when trauma happens, it affects your soul. And it's because it's such a heavy burden on your flesh that it, your soul is sucked into it with it. Do you guys understand that? Your soul is attached to your flesh on one side. It is, your flesh is subject to the enemy, of course. Okay? Did you guys know that the enemy can only affect your flesh? He can only speak to your mind, and then he can only try to screw up what's here or on this earth, okay? He can't affect your soul unless you let, his, let the flesh affect it. Pain in the world, like I said, the world does things to affect your flesh, and pain, of course, affects your flesh. And then your soul is affected by your flesh, because it is attached on one side. Now, your soul is subject to your flesh on one side, and your spirit on the other. Okay? It, it's kind of protected in there. It's, it's got a protective barrier. And your spirit is subject to your soul and to God. So here's what happens. When trauma happens, your flesh is so affected that it sucks the other two right into it with it. All of a sudden your flesh is taken to such a lowly spot that it drags your spirit or your soul down and then includes in that and takes your soul or your spirit with it. So when these people are suffering trauma, oh, let me, let me say, the one thing that she said, she was, the lady that was doing the, Caroline Egan that was doing the seminar, she said she was talking to one victim, she's sitting in her office and the lady comes in and she goes, do you do soul recovery? That's what she asked the lady. And Carolyn said, I'm not exactly sure if I know what you mean. She's like, why don't you explain to me what you mean? And she was in Albuquerque, or Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time, and they have a lot of Catholicism down there that's kind of off on a, like a voodoo strain. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, about um, some Hispanic Catholicism kind of gets into some weird stuff. Yes. Okay, so this lady comes in there, and, you know, there's all these kind of clinics for this kind of um, I'm going to say voodoo with parentheses because that's the best way to how to describe it. And, but she, this lady comes in to Carolyn, who is actually, you know, trained, minister, you know, a legitimate person. And she goes, what exactly do you mean? And she said, I was abused as a child repeatedly. And every time I was abused, a little piece of my soul was taken away. She goes, but I want it back. And when she told, when I heard her say that, when I heard Carolyn share that line from that victim, this picture right here popped into my mind instantly. Her soul didn't disappear, did it? It's just been so covered up by the smashing her flesh had that she does not see it anymore. And since her flesh was smashed so far down to the ground, her spirit was down there with it in the soul and completely buried up by all that. Us as Christians have access to the Holy Spirit and to the throne of God and to everything that God has for us. And our spirit has access to God. So I say as a Christian, whatever the enemy, the world does to your flesh, God is on the other side with your spirit willing to pull you out of whatever trauma, whatever abuse, whatever it is that you went through and to pull you up out of that, to deliver you from that. I use the Lord of the Rings analogy all the time. The battle is on Middle Earth. The battle is for Middle Earth. And as the movie, as the trilogy goes on, 
the enemy just slowly and very methodically starts taking over Middle Earth, doesn't it? And you see on the map towards the end of the movie that there's only a small part of Middle Earth that's even left anymore. There's only a small part of the soul that's left anymore. It's this tiny little bit, right? Well, what happens? Jesus comes in, right? Aragorn comes in and he says, we're going to rise up and we're going to fight and we're going to take Middle Earth back. We're going to take your soul back. So what do they do? They go in and fight. And not only do they take back they take back everything that was taken. They go all the way to the gates of hell, don't they? They go all the way to the gates of Mordor. They're not happy with just taking back what used to be Middle Earth. We're going all the way back to the gates of Mordor, and we're going to finish this too. It's exactly what God wants to do to everybody. Whether you've had trauma, whether you've just had a small little incident in your life, whatever it is, God wants to restore your soul fully. He wants you to be fully accepted. Your flesh, this right here, is supposed to go this direction. It's this way, not that way. When trauma happens, all of a sudden we fall this way. You understand, family? Your flesh is so affected that it grabs your soul and your spirit and drags you down to the earth, back to dust, right, Carrie? Back to dirt. Your flesh always wants to go back to dirt. And trauma is the perfect opportunity for it to say, okay, all right. We hear about people that suffer through trauma, like veterans and stuff like that. What do they want to do? Suicide, right? Because the flesh wants to take you back to the dirt. And your flesh was so affected that you're suicidal now. You're murderous now. You're done. We want to go this way. We want God to grab hold of our spirit, and we want to go with him this way. And our flesh can come along. It has to, doesn't it? But it's supposed to be over here doing what we say it to do, what the Spirit tells us to do. And you know what? When we're pulling this way, it says your soul is subject to what? Your flesh and your spirit. If your spirit is pulling on your soul, if your spirit is larger than you've ever let your flesh ever get, then your soul is going to be fine. And that post-traumatic soul disorder will go away. And it might take a little bit. How much are you going to allow your spirit to pull your soul up out of your flesh? Are you going to leave it sitting there? Are you going to have two separate lives? Are you going to leave your flesh and your trauma over here in a closet and forget about it? Or are you going to let God pull all of it out and live in that freedom? And so we're going to go to the scripture Carrie had me read this morning in Sunday school. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest for your souls. Remember I said that the Spirit pulls us this way? The Spirit's going to pull us this way? We have that yoke on Jesus. We put on His yoke. It's not so hard to walk this way, to pull this way. He says my yoke is easy, my burden is light, so we're always going to go this way. And if our spirit is pulling this way, what does it say our soul's going to do? Have rest. Now, does rest sound like my medulla oblongata going crazy on me every day? No, that doesn't sound, that sounds, if my soul is at rest, I'm not going to be flooded with these emotions, flooded with these hormones, flooded with this physical sense of trying to get back to the dirt as fast as I can. I'm going to live such an easier existence. Jesus says, it's easy. My burden's light. Come this way with me, he says. And you're going to have rest for your soul. Your soul is attached to your spirit. And Christ himself knows, if you come this way, I'm going to make it all okay. And I just wanted to share, because I, me and Carrie have talked about this plenty of times. Me and Anthony talked about this when I was doing youth group. So you young ones, listen up. Everything that happened or said in the New Testament is because somebody prophesied that it would happen in the Old Testament. Do you know that that's what our faith is built on? That we can look back 2,000 years ago in the Old Testament and look and see that either Christ himself repeated it or that it actually happened in, in real time, in, in exactly like it said. And so I went back to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. 
Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. So Jeremiah is saying, you know what? When you look back here at these ancient scriptures, when you come to the crossroads of your life, okay, you're going to look back and you're going to say, show me the good way. What is the way that I should go? And he says, and when you find that, you're going to have rest for your souls. And of course, we all know that Jeremiah and I was talking about Christ, was he not? He says, you know what? All this that I'm writing right now, that's going to be ancient text. When you guys look at it, it's going to point to Christ. It's going to be the crossroads. When you ask what's the way I should go, what's the easy way, the good way, and walk in it, he says. You're going to find rest unto your soul. We know that's Jesus Christ. And he says, come on to me, and I will give you rest unto your souls. And when I was in that seminar, all I could do was pity people who are stuck in a clinic that have medicine that mask the trouble that their flesh is going through, that mask the need for their soul to be restored, that mask your knowledge that God could probably pull me out of this, you know? It just it breaks my heart, makes me sad. But I wanted to share it with you guys. I wanted to share it with you guys here today because last time I was up here I talked about depression and how joy can pull you out. But sometimes joy, you know, just seems like such a far off thing, okay? So, okay, I can't find joy. But let me find rest for my soul at least. Do you understand me, family? I find joy easy because I love Jesus and I love helping others, or love loving others. And that's what Jesus said will find you joy. But isn't there a place in between there that I can get first? Is there a stepping stone between straight down in the ditch and feeling terrible, straight to joy? Well, I think I kind of found it. Just having rest for your soul. Just being at peace for a moment, right? And that comes when we give our burdens to Christ. And when I heard, when we went through this session, the second half was on military, okay? It was on how veterans suffer trauma. She even went, they even went as far to say, boot camp itself is trauma, okay? And I, my stomach just kept churning and churning and churning, and all I could think about was my kid. And what I heard them saying was, your kid's been in boot camp, your kid's going to be a veteran, your kid's going to suffer trauma, your kid's going to do, that's what I heard. Every time they were saying this about veterans, so I'm like, I, I felt like they were pointing their fingers at me and saying, this is what's going to happen to your kid. And as she was sitting there going through all the reasons that this is trauma and stuff like that, I couldn't help but think about the sermon that I preached the last time and the way you guys all seen Cain. He had the joy of the Lord. He had rest unto his soul because he knows his burdens are Christ. Did that kid look traumatized to you? I, you know, so, so basically what I'm saying is that Christ is the answer for everything, okay? Whether you're trying to avoid trauma because Christ is your protector, he's your shield, he's, he's everything for you, or whether you've already suffered trauma and now I'm going to reach out to Christ and I'm going to say, take my spirit, pull my soul out of my flesh and set me free. Either way, he's going to work it out for you. And, and I know that there's people who have seen sadness, who have seen trauma, who've seen depression, and people just, you know, they, they don't get better. And, and I don't understand that, and I've said that before, I don't understand that, but I know that there is an answer for it. Whether some people find that answer and live through it, whether some people never find the answer, which just breaks my heart or makes me sad, but I know that there's an answer for it, and I want everybody else here to know that there's an answer for it, because what I did learn is that, like I said at the beginning of this, Almost everybody's going to suffer some kind of trauma in their life. And if it's as determined to a body, to a person, to their soul, as what this lady claimed to be, we need God. And we, as a congregation, need to share God to all the people that we know are traumatized out there. It's the truth of it. They're everywhere. There's people everywhere that have been traumatized, that have that lived with a continual reliving of that trauma and are just killing themselves daily. They're letting their flesh take them back to the dirt as fast as they can. So let's think about that. Think about the freedom that we have in Christ, the, the healing, 
the, the word that we can share with people and the fact that we know as Christians that we shouldn't have any burdens. We should have rest unto our soul because we've given it all to Christ. Hallelujah. So, saying enough now, can we worship the Lord today? Anthony, you want to come up?
you surrender today? Are you tired of trying it in your own way? Is he begging you today? Pushing his spirit on you?
you say you this time, Lord God. I thank you for the worship, the word, Lord God, the fellowship that we have here, the family that you created, the body here, Lord God. Be with us as we enjoy the meal, Lord God, and as we continue the fellowship in your spirit, Lord God, with each other. In Jesus' name we pray.